Welcome to Fellowship 1-7, a biblical podcast from Child Evangelism Fellowship for the Christian community. On this podcast, we discuss various biblical topics, passages, and truths, and how those truths have impacted the lives of people around the world. I'm your host, Elizabeth Yoder. We are meeting with Jeremy Lloyd again, and we're discussing the very, very heavy topic that also has a little bit of hope mixed in. Um, well, I shouldn't say mixed in. That has an ultimately hopeful ending. Um, and it's just our statement of faith concerning lost souls and their relation to our ministry. So, Jeremy, before we go into the second part of this, would you mind reintroducing yourself and maybe giving us a really quick recap on what we talked about last time? Yeah, so I'm an editor here at CEF. I get to edit the podcast, the video scripts to magazines, kind of everything else. And every now and then I get to write some of that stuff. So it's a great job. I very much enjoy what I do. Last time we, we talked about how God does punish those who are in sin. Everybody on earth is is in eternal peril because of their sins, but he provided hope in Christ. A lot of people will look at Christianity and say, well, how can this loving, good God punish people? But it's because he's a holy God. Ultimately, if you think of it in like a courtroom setting, a good judge has to punish something. A, a, a bad judge is the one that lets the bad guys go. You, you right. can't do that. And so when when there is sin, it has to be punished. And God being eternally holy, eternally just, those two things coordinate in such a way that he has to punish sin. Mm-hmm. And then we also touched on, um, in light of that punishment, we as Christians have the hope of Jesus who took on yes. that that ultimate punishment for us. Yeah, so. he, he, bore, he bore that punishment in our place so that we could we could have eternal life. Not just like a get out of hell free car where we right. don't have to endure the punishment, but we get all of the blessings in heaven and everything that goes along with being with Christ forever. Yeah. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we talked on. We do want to reiterate again that this is a very heavy topic. Um, and especially for us, because we are a children's ministry Uh, This can be a topic that is difficult to approach with children. So uh, before we talk about how we discuss this uh, judgment and everything with kids, could you maybe just enlighten us a little bit on how this statement relates to children, the statement of God being just and passing judgment on people? Well, the children are sinners in in the same way that adults are sinners. David said in Psalm 51, 5, in sin did my mother conceive me. And David's not saying there that his mother had an extramarital affair or that she had premarital sex. And that's when David was conceived. What, he, right. what he's saying is that the moment I was conceived, it, I, was, I, was, I had a sin nature. Mm-hmm. When God cursed the world, when Adam and Eve fell, there was a, a sin nature. There was this curse put upon the earth. And everyone to come from Adam and Eve has this sin nature. I, I did not teach my children how to sin. They, they figured right. that out on their own. My parents didn't teach me how to sin. I was very, very good at it, just coming straight out of the womb. I, I, and even younger children, even kids before they can, they can speak, can lie. Sometimes they'll cry just because they want their mom there. Nothing's wrong. They, oh, just, yeah. they just want oh, mommy, yeah. right? And so, so kids also are sinners. And now there is one thing to consider is the fact of, of maybe someone who's too young to even understand understand the gospel, and some people refer to that as as like an age of accountability. I like the the idea of condition of accountability better mm-hmm. because uh, it is age is just a number, and certain everyone matures and understands it at a slightly different pace. But those who tragically might perish at, a, at the age of two before they would have <clears throat> have a way to come to Christ, I, I believe that somehow in in God's providence, He made provision in Christ on the cross for for those children. And the fact that David also says when David lost one of his children, he says in the Old Testament, I will go, I, he cannot come to me, but I will go to him. Yeah. And some, some who might say, well, he's just talking about dying. Well, David would have derived no comfort in saying, well, my son's dead. And okay, well, it's the news isn't all bad. I'm going to die someday too. You know, David was, right. he was taking consolation and knowing that, that one day when, when he died, he would be able to be reunited with his child in heaven. Mm-hmm. So there is this condition of accountability that, that we believe in, but children, 
get they're they're pretty smart like I, you know you talk to five six seven year old kids they they can understand a lot of things i'm I'm surprised at my young kids who, who are homeschooled that some of the things they'll tell me they'll point out birds or whatever see that's oh, yeah that's this or whatever it is i'm like really and i've I've learned not to even question it because <laughs> not not just are you making that up no, no they, they really know these things oh, and yeah. so so they pick up on that stuff and so what children are under the weight of their sin and and they they need christ just like i need christ and you need christ and every adult needs christ children need christ to be rescued from their their sin Mm -hmm. and we can kind of see i know you took some courses at cmi and we'll touch on that a little bit later um and i had a very very brief introduction to the theology of child conversion and they do a really good job in there of talking about when the spirit convicts it's not people who sit there like you were saying kids know kids know how to sin before they even know what that is um but the spirit convicts them of right and wrong and so uh, we have to be very careful of that as ministers of the word being aware that yes um there is an age of or a um condition condition that's the word i like that word better uh there is a condition of responsibility when you when you learn um you learn of what you're doing wrong so on that note would you say that um what would we say if a child is too young to understand the importance of this decision so the the idea that god gives to to parents is that they should always put before their children the the word of god and the teaching of god and so deuteronomy 6 is what what's referred to as as the shema and it it says in part here the these words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. And so that kind of encompasses all day long. At yeah. every point in the day, be talking about God and his word and be instructing your children in these ways and having having good conversations. You know, the the youth leader or the children's pastor is not the primary discipler Mm -hmm. of the hearts of your children. You are the shepherd of your children's hearts. And so it is your job to raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And so that way, when they get to this, this time, there, there's no switch that comes on right. that, that just says, okay, now today on you know, this child has now reached the condition of accountability. And so just as a parent myself, we have, we have five kids and my oldest son is, is a believer and that, that manifested for him in just, he would get very convicted over his sin. And he, he wasn't, he wasn't afraid of, of hell per se. And, and here at CEF, we don't, we don't start with, you know, hellfire and all these things. We talk right. about it as, as being separated from God and, and this type of thing. So we're not trying to scare children into this, but we are confronting them with the reality that, that we are all sinners and that there is a way to salvation through Christ. But my, my oldest son was just convicted of, of doing uh, sinful things and, and yeah. the way he continued to do sinful things. And, and over, over a few weeks, my, my wife and I had prayed even more fervently than we already were and that manifested in, in him coming to Christ uh, when I just it just felt right at that moment. Now my my second son has been showing a, a lot of interest in in the things of Christ and and if I were to say, hey, why why don't you accept Christ? He would just say yes. He right. loves me. He wants to please me as his father. And so I, I'm not always going up and saying, why don't you accept Christ? Because he's agreeable to all of these things that that we're teaching him. And so we believe that salvation comes by faith. Mm-hmm. It's not by anything that that we do. I had a friend in college who. He grew up kind of Christian friendly, but he wasn't actually a believer. He wasn't antagonistic or anything, but he just wasn't wasn't giving his life to Christ. And and some other friends of mine were with him a lot, and they they were sharing the gospel with him and talking to them. And then he kind of called one of them one day and just said, "Hey, I, I just woke up this morning and just realized that that I'm a believer." You know, he did, he didn't kneel down and pray a prayer. Mm-hmm. He he didn't do any of those types of things. He just believed. Yeah. And that that's what the gospel is. Even C.S. Lewis talks about he he had been wrestling with all these things in Christianity and he didn't want to be a Christian. He was right. this atheist and he and his brother get in I think it was a, a I think it was a motorcycle with a sidecar and he was riding in the sidecar and he, he left his house an atheist and when they arrived at the zoo he was a believer. He just he he just everything in him that was pressing against all of that just collapsed under the weight of the truth of the gospel and he just by the time he got there he just he just believed and he referred to himself as the most reluctant convert in, in history but yes. the truth of it was just before him and so I think it's entirely possible that my second son is a believer at this point even though he's you know he's not 
pray to prayer or anything, but I, I think he, we, we teach him and instruct him in these things enough that he has enough information to, to believe in the gospel and he knows what sin is. And so, and he's agreeable to all of these things as well. Yeah. And I think it's, to put this into like, this is a horrible way of saying it, but like a worldly perspective, it's, it's no different than you teaching your kids right and wrong. Sure. Um, you, you teach them, you know, don't, don't lie. If you lie, people don't trust you or be honest with mom and dad when something bad does happen. So that way we can help you, um, manage that. And so as a Christian, it's no different than that. We're teaching them values, right and wrong, but from a biblical perspective and and the things that are most ultimate in in the universe yes and and so that we are instructing them in those ways right Mm -hmm. and we can kind of see that god has the same mindset in how he speaks to kids so we can look at like the story of samuel right that you know god chose this young kid to one be the next prophet but also to deliver a message to eli and um be this be this leader in the Israeli community, Israeli people. Um, so I think it's important to note that. Do you have any other comments on how, if God truly speaks to kids and where we might be able to see that? Yeah. So God doesn't say, oh, well, you know, you're not 10 yet. I can't, you know, I can't yeah. start talking to you or anything. He, he uses children. As a matter of fact, I've always found it really interesting in, in Luke 1 when Gabriel is talking to Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, and telling mm-hmm. him that, that he's going to have a child. I, I, I'll, I always love what Gabriel says when Zechariah questions him. How, how are we going to know this? He says, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And, but then he, he begins to tell him, and he says, he will have the Holy Spirit from the womb. And so he, he tells him that, that he will actually have the Holy Spirit while he's still in his mother's womb. Now, I don't, I don't think that that's something that happens all the time. Right. And, and that's, to my knowledge, that's the only time in Scripture that we're told that. But it, God somehow regenerated John the Baptist while, he, while his mother was pregnant with him. Mm-hmm. And so even at that age, and then, and then right after that is the story where Mary comes yep. and, and Mary speaks and John leaps in his mother's womb because he heard the voice of the, of the mother of the Messiah. Mm-hmm. And just this wonderful, sweet, tender picture of the way that God, God shows children. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast actually this morning where a 12-year-old boy wrote in and asked this, this preacher, you know, how do I know if God might be calling me? To, to be a preacher. And so he began to say, you know, I think God can very much speak to, to you as a 12 year old boy. And he said, I was about 12 years old when I began to start thinking through these things as well. So, so in this 12 year old boy that asked this question and the man that, that answered both of them at about the age of 12 had started to feel that God was leading them into some sort of preaching ministry. I was only six years old when I was saved. Mm-hmm. And so here at CEF, we're not, we're not specific about, about, mode of baptism but but for me i'm a baptist and so my dad was a pastor and he was baptizing someone in church and he was explaining what what was necessary to be baptized and i suddenly realized that i did not qualify for this because i had not professed faith in christ at this point and and dad just explained the gospel i think by god's grace i think that was the first time i i heard and fully understood the gospel at the age of six and just, I mean, it was like a light switch. I just said, yep, I need to do this. And so, so that night after church, I, I went home and, and received Christ on, on my parents' bed right there beside my dad. And so I was, I was six. And I, I, as an adult at this point, I, I genuinely believe that was the moment I was converted. Yeah. And so from, from my own life as well, I, there are plenty of examples where, where God convicts children, where he, he shows himself to children. And, and he works through them and even begins to call them yeah, at, at and, a younger age. Yeah, and I love how you tied that into today even because I think sometimes we we think that God displays himself only in Old Testament Scripture or New sure. Testament Scripture. But no, God's still using kids today, and we see that in your life. I mean, I was saved at five. Yeah. So there's there's all kinds of stories like that if you take the time to ask. And, sure. and God is moving. He's relevant still. Um, and, yeah. He, he still he still speaks to kids and we have the opportunity as people in ministry with CEF of presenting the gospel to kids and like you had touched on earlier we we don't sit there and teach hell death destruction turn or burn like that's right. not what we do um, we do teach them a reality of there is a punishment 
but there is hope. So I know you've taken a few more CMI classes than I have, so I'm going to kind of give you the reins here and let you discuss that a little bit of how we approach this topic as an organization. Yeah, so CMI is Children's Ministries Institute here at CEF, and it's a semester-long college level type of course that that anybody can take we have people in there who have just graduated from high school we have we have people who are in their 60s or so mm-hmm. I mean, even, even above and beyond that so there's no age limit as as far as how high it goes but they they take the entire semester each class is normally about a week there's a couple of two-week classes in there but we do everything from teaching the world religions we teach what are our methods for believing in the the theology of children and salvation and all of these various types of things it's very good even some colleges around the country have accredited some of these classes Mm -hmm. and so it's it's a very real very and and i can just say from experience sometimes the the workload's pretty pretty heavy and so it's it's fun it's enjoyable the the ladies and the men that teach this do do a tremendous job have a lot of experience and so it's very good and as you said we're not going in and just trying to to scare children with hell we're accused of that sometimes in in the media of of trying to just put hell in front of kids just to scare them to believe in christ and and we're not just like with anything else we are just showing that there are our punishment there are consequences for the things that you do and ultimately you're gonna to have to stand before God one day and, and give an account and your only hope in the same way that my only hope on that day is going to be that you've believed in in the work of Christ and so with that also culminates in what we what we call good news clubs which is we were able to go in to a lot of different places but but one of the main places we go into is public schools actually and so we will go in I was at one yesterday at a Good News Club, just a few miles from where we're standing right now. And we, we go in, we'll play games. Sometimes there's snacks. They, they let me enjoy the snacks sometimes as well, which I'm very pleased <laughs> Do with. Do they have pizza? <laughs> they don't have pizza. No, we did have cookies <laughs> yesterday, so I was very happy about that. And But we, we play games, just really interact with the kids. And then we have a Bible lesson. They have an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And sometimes the children will actually come out. And I, there was one boy yesterday that I could just, I, I, he was six, and I could, even when I was, I was actually the one that taught the lesson yesterday, I could, I could just kind of see in his eyes, he was like locked in, and he was, he was just really there with me, and he was one of the ones that came out and wanted to talk afterward, and, and he, he, I think he had been raised in a Christian home, because he knew some of the answers, and I couldn't tell if it was necessarily from going to Good News Club for a while, right. or, but it seemed as if he was probably in a church somewhere, he said that he goes to church, and, and so I could see it. I could just see the gospel wheels sort of turning in his head already. I don't know if he is a believer or if this is God, just one of the steps along the way that God is is going to use for him. But it's it's the the way we do our ministry. And, it, and sometimes there will be some at public libraries or churches or people's houses. And just any, any place we can go, we're going to share the gospel with kids as God gives us the opportunity to. Yeah, and, and I love that you kind of had a connection with him too with being six. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's... Again, God uses kids. He does. Um, he does. And, and he, he has this beautiful forgiveness plan for them. Yeah. And yeah. Um, God doesn't want, I think it's important to note that God doesn't want people to be separated from his presence and right. from his glory for eternity. But he calls people to, to be his kids. Yeah. He wants people to spend yeah. the rest of their spiritual existence yeah. with him. Yeah. And and so you know we we talked a lot about just the the fact that there is there is judgment and it's because God is holy because we creatures of the dirt have offended the infinite holiness of this magnificent glorious God mm-hmm. and that that sin deserves to be punished but knowing what sin is makes the gospel more sweet Yes. And, and knowing that there is this weight and this punishment, but knowing that, that God himself became a man, he lived the perfect life, he, Christ lived and never sinned one time, and then he died in my place, he was raised from the dead, and he ascended to, to reign in heaven, that just makes the gospel more sweet, knowing that in my place condemned he stood, as, as the old hymn says, and and people that get frustrated with Christians thinking about hell, they, they don't understand the God side of it because God is, is ultimate. We, mm-hmm. we, are, we are created beings. God is ultimate. He's eternal in his glory and his power and his wisdom. And everything about God is, is infinite. And we are, we are so finite and so small. And he has chosen to set his affections upon us. He has chosen 
not just he has chosen to rescue us when we flouted his kingship over this universe and he has made a way he's made provision for us in not just somehow but in his son yeah. in his son he put him to death for us and when we would say to those people that that yell at us for for the the doctrine of hell we would say that our our sins are more dreadful than we would have ever dared to believe but that Christ is more wonderful and lovely than we can possibly imagine. Yeah, and that is a beautiful note to end on, that there is hope, um, and it's through Jesus. Yes. So thank you again for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I so enjoy you being here and um, just being able to, like I said last time, pick your brain and see see what God's revealing to you because it's always so in depth and beautiful and I love Thank seeing you. I love seeing how he is speaking to you. If you would like to learn more about who CEF is and what we believe, you can visit cefonline.com/about. This will also be linked in the show notes. Be sure to check out Unite Radio where we unite kids with the gospel through adventures and foundational biblical truths. Give us a like and subscribe to keep up to date on both this podcast and our kids program. Thanks for listening.